How does Moses make his coffee? Yeah, pretty good. Very good. Moses is not Mostly has a similar response to my joke as I had to your joke, so there you go. I have another quick joke. Do you know how boyfriend and girlfriend are both a single word, but best friend is two words? It's because best friends know how to give you a little space. Oh. <laughs> Made it a little too close to home for some of you, but. And then you get married and there's still no space. So anyway, just kidding. Uh, all right, moving in. So we're talking about rheumatology. So we have a couple of different topics we're going to hit on here. We have uh, rheumatoid arthritis. We have osteoarthritis. We're going to kind of look at those in parallel to kind of see how they differ and how they uh, compare as far as drug treatment goes. And then we'll get into stuff like gout and I think it's the uh, osteoporosis. We'll talk about that as well. Okay. So anyway, so the immune response, we've probably talked about this ad nauseum uh, in the past here. But um, again, what's kind of the main pathophysiologic issue with rheumatoid arthritis? The body is basically attacking itself, right? So just like we talked about in GI with UC or Crohn's disease, like the body's inappropriately attacking itself. Same thing's happening here with rheumatoid arthritis. Here it's attacking the joints primarily, right? But obviously we know there can be other, um, uh, you know, manifestations that happen outside of that, but we're mainly going to focus on the joints. Um, if you remember, like, how do we manage the inflammation with ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease? What do we use? Yes, we use things like corticosteroids are really important there to help tamp down the immune system. What else do we use? We use things like 5 amino salicylic acid. We use other things to try to help to decrease that inflammation chronically. And so we're going to find that um, similar to here, we're going to have drugs that are good for sort of the acute manifestations. And also we're going to have some drugs that are good as what we call disease modifying drugs, right? So these are going to be things that will help to slow down the progression to hopefully save the joints for as long as we can. So um, you guys have covered RA with... Dr. O already correct, right? So you know some of those manifestations, right? They can have severe deformity of the joints. It can really have a big impact on their activities of daily living. So we want to hold off on that as best we can and try to keep the joints functional for longer, right? And we know that by helping to deal with that inflammation, it's going to be able to, to delay that, that progression of that damage into the joints in the long term, right? Um, and again, this whole pathophysiology is essentially the same for lupus or for vasculitis, all sorts of different things, but here we're going to mainly focus on RA. Um, and again, as you have these immune cells being activated, they're releasing a lot of different sort of inflammatory cytokines. They're going to be having these lysosomal enzymes being released, and that's, again, what's doing the damage to the joints themselves. So and again, when you think about RA joints, they're hot, they're red, they're inflamed, they get swollen. These are things we're going to be trying to focus on when we're dealing with that inflammation that's occurring there, right? Um, also, a lot, of, a lot of neutrophil damage that happens here. And again, they're releasing H2O2. What's another name for that? Hydrogen peroxide are in a very, very highly reactive. They generate the free radicals. And again, that can interfere with a lot of proteins and, and DNA and all sorts of things. So we want to try to avoid that as best we can. Um, you've seen pictures of this before, but just remember our typical pathways here. Um, when we think about NSAIDs, what enzyme are they primarily working on? Right, cyclooxygenase, right? And this is the cyclooxygenase pathway where you see a lot of prostaglandins, prostacyclins, or are all going to be formed here, right? Uh, remember that lipoxygenase pathway is also there. What, what, where, what disease state do we see that working in? Yeah, asthma is the big thing. So reactive airway disease. Remember those leukotrienes we talked about? You want to inhibit those if you have asthma. Um, this pathway is going to be less important for our purposes. And then certainly, but even higher than that, right, the top of the pyramid is going to be where our corticosteroids are fitting in, where they actually prevent those phospholipases from working in the first place. You're decreasing trans, uh, um, transcription of these inflammatory genes and things like that. So, uh, again, very, very powerful. Again, also a lot of side effects associated with that. Now, we talked about, you know, what's the, what's the, the most beneficial dose of corticosteroids a patient can be on? Zero. Preferably, right, because of all the side effects are going to be associated with that. However, especially with things like RA, they may need to be on it every single day, right? So you may find patients who are on, uh, going to be on prednisone on a daily basis because of the fact they just need that chronic anti-inflammatory action there. Again, it kind of speaks to the um, how much inflammation is really happening here, right? Now, how do we get around that with using with something like Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis? Yes, we had some other drugs, we had some anti-metabolites we could use potentially, but remember, we still use corticosteroids for those flare-ups, but how can we use a corticosteroid that maybe didn't have systemic effects? Yeah, we used, actually used budesonide. It was an oral form that actually had no bioavailability because the first pass was so high, right? So again, that was one way we could get around that. 
Do we have that ability to do that with joints with RA? Not really, right? You can do some intra-articular corticosteroids, but again, depending on how diffuse the disease is and how many joints are being affected, it may find that to be kind of difficult. But we'll look at some options for that in just a little bit as well. Okay, so looking at this, um, you know, I'm not going to get super deep on the the epidemiology and all of that, because uh, again, you've already covered that in other classes here. But again, um, typically, how do you diagnose it? Yes, yeah, live test, but again, typically it's like based off the symptomatology, right? They're going to be complaining. And, and it, sometimes it's hard to kind of catch that super early uh, for those patients. And, and in those cases, there, it's important because we want to try to save those joints as long as we can. So if they're already kind of manifesting symptoms, you really want to kind of get on that uh, on top of that as best you can to try to help save as much joint uh, as possible. Because again, once you lose that synovial lining, it's kind of hard to get that back, right? Anyway, um, so again, when you have this chronic inflammation of that joint capsule, is going to get swollen, it's going to get hot, it's going to get red, um, and so eventually you're going to find more uh, destruction and erosion of the joint itself, and then that can lead to some of those deformations that actually happen there uh, in, in the long term. Um, again, a lot of the drugs we're going to be focusing on, we're going to be looking at our DMARDs. You've covered a few of the DMARDs already, correct, with Dr. O? What are some of the ones you talked about? Methotrexate is a good one. That's a kind of a non-biologic DMARD. Did you talk about any monoclonal antibodies? Infliximab. Yeah. And again, those are going to be much more specific for shooting for different targets, right? So whether they're looking at tumor necrosis factor, whether they're focused on interleukin-6, whatever the case may be, right, those are going to be very specific. What's the problem with methotrexate? It's not very specific, right? It affects all the cells essentially, right? Because how does it work? Right, inhibits the ability for those cells to use folic acids. You can't produce new DNA. Those inflammatory cells cannot replicate, essentially. Um, so again, you're going to be using these same concepts because, again, the path of, or the actual way these drugs are working has not really changed a whole lot. It's just a matter of what disease they were using them for. So again, use a lot of that information to be able to kind of carry it forward because we're going to be seeing it here again in just a few minutes. Anyway, um, so again, by targeting these different things like interleukin, tumor necrosis factor, et cetera, uh, we're going to be able to kind of halt and arrest that inflammatory cascade and hopefully try to prevent any further progression here. And it also helps to decrease things like B cell and T cell activation here. Um, you know, we're going to find the complement system is not going to be quite so activated, uh, et cetera. So again, very powerful at helping to decrease the inflammation overall. Um, T cells are really important for as far as TNF alpha and, and interleukins go. So again, this is going to be a big way we can try to specifically target T cell activation by using some of those monoclonal antibodies, right? Now, again, we're going to find kind of where they fit into therapy versus some of the non-biologic, some of the earlier therapies. And again, um, can you always get away with just using one drug for these patients? A lot of times you need combination therapy, right? So we're going to look at what appropriate combinations are going to be um, between, like, say, our biologic and non-biologic DMARDs and all of that. So we'll see that's going to be very important as well. We can even shoot for some of the CD receptors that are responsible for some of the cell-to-cell -cell signal. By targeting that as well, you can actually help to in uh, interrupt that inflammatory cascade. Anyway, so this is a picture I kind of want wanted to get to. Um, looking at the, say, normal sort of a joint here versus where you have a uh, more activated infl inflammatory system where you have a lot of that joint destruction that occurs here. Again, we're trying to save this as much as we can. So by decreasing the inflammation chronically, whether it be with methotrexate or infliximab, whatever the case may be, you're hopefully going to be able to hold that off and hopefully retain the ability for them to use those joints effectively for longer, right? And again, when you think about things like how, how do you have to give a monoclonal antibody? Can you give it orally? No, you have to give it via injection, right? So again, think about like a drug like Humira or adalimumab. It actually comes as a pen. The patient could inject themselves. Well, what's the problem with rheumatoid arthritis? It affects the hands. They may not be able to inject themselves. So these are things you're going to have to think about. Like, okay, well, I, I prescribe this drug to the patient. Great, it's a good drug, but they can't give it to themselves. Or they don't, maybe if you had to have a drug where they have to actually come into an infusion center to receive, like infliximab, do they have the ability to even get there? Do they have a car they can drive? Maybe they can't drive anymore, right? Because their joints are so affected, they can't really uh, do that, or they have no one to take them. So some things to consider when you're uh, looking at these medications. It's nice that they can just take a pill, but a lot of these other uh, more powerful sort of medications may not be that easy, right? So little things to think about. Anyway, um, as compared to that, look at osteoarthritis. Kind of what's the pathophys going on with osteoarthritis? It's like your tires are running out of rubber. You're seeing those tires like they go way too long without getting replaced, and they start to have like the metal kind of strips in them that are starting to show. It's not a good sign. That's kind of what's happened with osteoarthritis. You can look up some pictures if you don't know what I'm talking about. But um, basically, the joints are wearing out, right? So again, what kind of patients do you think normally manifest osteoarthritis? Older patients. What else? Hmm? 
They have potentially athletes, right, just because they're using the joints more, for sure. Who else is kind of putting extra load on their joints? Obesity is another big one, right? So again, just having way too much weight on there to cause too much damage done to the joints over time. And again, a lot of the pain that comes about from osteoarthritis isn't necessarily the inflammation like you would see with RA, but it's more just kind of like that bone on bone, that's kind of nerves being activated from that friction that occurs there because you've lost some of that synovial lining, right? Um, so again, the, the pathophysiology is very different. The management's also going to be very different as far as what uh, we're going to be treating here. So there's not going to be any monoclonal antibodies we're going to be using, but there are some parallels. So we're going to see there is a place for corticosteroids to be used, right? We're going to see things like NSAIDs can also be used for OA. So it's important to kind of understand the parallels between the two and then also how they kind of diverge in as far as what's appropriate treatment for one may not be necessarily appropriate for the other, as we'll see there. And what's the ultimate treatment for OA? Replace the joint, right? If you can, the knee, just replace the whole thing, right? Can I do that with RA? Nah, not necessary, right? Because again, you're just going to have that inflammation still being in place. And again, looking at, say, a normal joint compared to, say, osteoarthritis, where again, it's just that wear and tear over time, that friction happening between the bones uh, versus when uh, rheumatoid arthritis is very inflamed, um, and again, that damage is going to occur over time, linked to those joint deformities and decreased mobility, things like that. Anyway, um, and so what we're going to be finding is that, again, a lot of the pain that we're experiencing is due to mostly mechanical damage, which has some inflammatory sort of component to it, but not nearly as pronounced as you see with RA. So you're going to find that uh, anti-inflammatories are not going to be as big of a component here as you would see with something like RA, right? So you're not going to really see any monoclonal antibodies. There's no disease-modifying drugs that you can actually use uh, for osteoarthritis because again it's wear and tear right again the more you use the joint the more load you're going to put on it the worse it's going to be so for instance if you have someone with obesity who's got osteoarthritis what's the best thing you can tell them to do to kind of help out with that lose some weight right so if they lose some weight then eventually that has to take some of the load off of it you have to decrease that wear and tear over time right that is one thing you can try uh, to do right so that's part of that non-pharmacologic therapy we don't really have such easy options or um, you know kind of uh, you know, similar options like that for something like RA. So again, we'll look at some comparisons there in a few minutes. And you're just kind of making a comparison between, you know, say the normal sort of joint here versus one with osteoarthritis, so you have that wear and tear. And again, you're gonna have that bone on bone, which is causing that friction to occur, causing those nerves to be activated, some of that inflammation to happen there as well. Anyway, so what are our goals here? between RA and OA. We're going to be seeing that, yes, we want to relieve some of that pain and stiffness associated with both of them. We're going to find that pain can be treated a little bit differently between the two here. Uh, if there is inflammation present in OA, we can treat that. But the main thing for RA is to decrease inflammation, whether it be with glucocorticoids, whether it be with the monoclonal antibodies, whatever the case may be. And then obviously, you try to improve their function. Okay. Now, one of the things I didn't really mention, or I might have mentioned briefly when we were talking about pain meds before, is that you know pain is ultimately objective or subjective. Subjective, right? What are some objective measurements of how well, say, our pain management is working for a patient? You want to use functional goals, right? So again, they get around and do the things they want to do. So for instance, I'll use a personal example here. I decided I was going to get back and start hitting the weights again. Uh, and then I've been very fortunate in the past and never really had any injuries, but I was uh, maybe going and pushing myself a little too hard. I had to hide the tiger and all that. Uh, and I was lifting some weights and I felt something move in my back and I said, oh, that ain't right. <laughs> I put the weights back down and I had some significant pain associated with that. And the next day I was very sore and I said, I talking to my wife about it, you know, she's a pain management expert. She's like, oh, what's your pain like? And I was like, I don't know. It's like a four out of 10. I was like, but functionally, I can't like do the stuff I want to do. Like I'm very like tender. I can't like go and like pick up my kids and rough house with them as much as I want to. And she was like, oh my gosh, you, you've grown so much as, as, a, as a pain person. I was like, yes. I'm talking about functional goals, right? So then I took some Volterran gel that we got. We took across international borders when we got it from Nassau. It works great, I will tell you that much. Volterran gel, again, local area, just apply to the back. It works awesome. Anyway, um, but again, look at the functional goals. We want them to be functional, getting back out to work, doing what they want to do, et cetera, okay? And then especially for osteoarthritis, a little bit, but for more for rheumatoid arthritis, we would like to slow that joint damage as much as we can. Again, it's going to be less of a um, pharmacologic sort of concern for OA, but certainly for RA, this is going to be mainly where the drugs are helping out the most for the most part. Uh, and then again, for RA, if they're having a flare-up, we can do things to decrease that inflammation acutely. So we're going to see that's where kind of pulse dosing of our steroids are going to be really important there. And again, slowing down that disease progression is the biggest thing we're focusing on. Anyway, um, 
So of course, you know, looking at the non-pharmacologic stuff is where PT, OT is going to be super, super important for these patients, especially with um, osteoarthritis. You know, things like pull training can be really useful to help kind of relieve some of the um, the pressure on those joints. It can help out with that quite a bit. Um, you know, do most people end up sticking with things like physical therapy? No, how come? It's hard. I'm tired painful. So this is a big thing you, you have to think about. So again, when you ask people, what did they tried for their pain before, especially with osteoarthritis, like what did they try? Have you tried PT? And they're like, yeah, I tried it. But why didn't it work for you, right? You know, why didn't you stick with it? And sometimes it could be related to not optimal pain management. So that way they just hurt so much worse afterwards that they couldn't stick with it. Could be a number of different things. But these are things we like to focus on from non farm sort of therapy there. And again, obviously surgery, especially with osteoarthritis is going to be kind of the ultimate sort of treatment there. Just take out the joint, put a new one in, and you're good, right? It's kind of like making a bionic person or something. Um, looking at the pharmacologic therapy, comparing these two, we're gonna find that for chronic treatment, we're gonna find, especially for pain control, NSAIDs are gonna be a big component of this. We find that NSAIDs can also play a role in osteoarthritis, so that's gonna be something that is gonna be similar between the two. Now, acetaminophen, what kind of differentiates acetaminophen from NSAIDs? Yeah, and, uh, really acetaminophen is more of an antipyretic and analgesic, but as an anti-inflammatory. <laughs> Not really. So that's why you don't really see acetaminophen being used in RA, but you definitely see it being used in osteoarthritis. So it deals with the pain centrally, but doesn't deal with any of the inflammation peripherally. And so it's not really that effective for RA. So that's why you don't really ever see that being used in that case there. That's one, one kind of difference there. Lotus corticosteroids are also very good for dealing with inflammation. Notice here that in osteoarthritis, there really is no role for chronic corticosteroids. Okay. Um, you're also going to be finding that with OA, there's going to be more room for things like topical analgesics with things like topical NSAIDs, capsaicin, et cetera, is going to be more playing a prominent role in OA, but not really for RA. Um, and again, for acute exacerbations, corticosteroids are going to be your main mainstay of therapy for RA. For acute exacerbations of osteoarthritis is where more opioids come into play. And again, patients with chronic pain who are on chronic opioids, how does chronic pain normally start out? What does it start out as? Acute pain, right? So again, most people probably started out with some sort of acute pain issue that developed into chronic pain. This is where a lot of people end up getting started on opioids, and they never really can get off of them, mainly due to um, inappropriate pain control. They can't stick with PTOT, or just the pain is just so bad, and they, they stick on it for a good long period of time. But um, notice there's no opioid use for RA. It's not really going to help with that. Really, the inflammation is a big thing you need to worry about with that one. And then we're going to see the DMARPs come into play here. So these are disease-modifying anti-rheumatic drugs. Going to be playing a big role for RA. And then you can also get things like knee effusions, uh, it can be usually either aspiration, uh, especially if there's a lot of fluid and there's a lot of pressure. That can be one thing to do. And then also can corticosteroid injection. We'll talk about that briefly there. I'll, I'll never forget, I had one uh, patient with, and again, do, do kids get RA? Mm -hmm. Yeah, they have juvenile RA that can uh, develop there. So um, we had a patient who was in the ER. I mean, this kid's this knee was just like, just huge. It was probably three times the size of his other knee. And um, we had the rheumatologist actually come down. We we're going to do uh, an aspiration uh, of the joint and then actually put in some, some intra-articular corticosteroids. And I, mean, I could not believe how much fluid they're pulling off this kid's knee. It must have been 180 cc's of fluid just... 60 cc syringe, 60 cc syringe, 60 cc syringe. I was like, holy cow. And how did you think the kid felt after they took that out? Feel like a million bucks. It's like, wow, man, that feels so nice because all that pressure is gone there. And they put the steroids in, give some time to kick in, deal with that inflammation. Kids feel much, much better by the end of that. But that can be a very important thing as well. If you have a lot of fluid buildup, that can be very useful. Anyway, um, so getting into our DMARDs, again, that's a disease modifying anti rheumatic drugs. We're going to find two big categorizations here. We have biologic and non biologic. What do you think is the difference between the two when I say that? Biologic just means protein-based, right? So that's where our monoclonal antibodies come into play, okay? So when I say biologic, that's just what I mean, is a protein versus just a simple chemical sort of structure, right? Um, so methotrexate would be a non-biologic, right? Infliximab would be a biologic based off of that um, there. And again, what you're going to find is that they need to be started early on in therapy because that's going to help to preserve the joint as long as you can, okay? NSAIDs, corticosteroids, those are good for dealing with acute pain. They're good for symptomatic relief, but do you think they kind of stop the progression of disease? Not really, right? You're going to find that it doesn't really have a big role to play there. The DMARDs, those are going to be the cornerstone for trying to uh, preserve those joints as long as you can. Now, the traditional DMARDs and non-biologics include things like methotrexate, you have hydroxychloroquine, sulfasalazine, and leflunamide. Those are the main ones we're going to talk about. Then we have our biologic DMARDs, 
and they can then be broken down into what their specific target is. Because again, most of these are going to be monoclonal antibodies that are specifically targeted towards particular inflammatory cytokines. So whether it be TNF, tumor necrosis factor alpha, um, we'll find there's one called co-stimulation modulator called abatacept we'll talk about briefly. And then we'll look at interleukin-6 as being another target we can shoot for. And then we'll have tofacitinib. This is actually um, not technically a biologic, but it's kind of one of the new ones. And did um, uh, Dr. O talk about Zelgenes at all? Yeah, it's relatively new. And it's actually kind of changing how we're managing this for a lot of patients. So we'll, we'll talk about this as kind of a special um, uh, agent here. This is actually going to be um, a tyrosine kinase inhibitor. If you remember way back to pharmacodynamics, does anyone remember that class? You took it at a time. A proof. Um, but there uh, was a type of receptor called uh, tyrosine kinase receptor, and this is what that's actually going to be targeting here. And we'll look at how that actually works in a few minutes. So, less often used, some of the older agents we used to use include things like azathioprine, which we actually saw that could be used potentially for something like, you know, inflammatory bowel disease, uh, used occasionally. But we have things like anakinra, which is IL 1 antagonist. We have things like cyclosporin, cyclophosphamide. Where do we talk about cyclophosphamide? cancer, right? So again, we know that has an inhibitory effect on inflammatory cells. You can see how that ultimately can be anti-inflammatory. Um, and then if you have patients with a really, really good insurance, we used to use gold. Pretty cool, huh? Um, gold has some, some uh, got, actually gold is kind of toxic to the cells. And so it actually has some anti-inflammatory properties by kind of killing off some of those immune cells. A lot of these have a lot of toxicities that aren't really the, the risk kind of outweighed the benefits for these, which is why we're not really using them anymore and why we're moving more towards using more specific sort of agents like things like a tumor necrosis factor inhibitor or an IL-6 inhibitor, things like that, okay? Anyway, um, looking at these, uh, we don't know the full mechanism, right? We know what their targets are, but again, there's probably some downstream effects we're not really fully uh, aware of. Um, but what we do know is that for the most part, when you're kind of comparing the efficacy versus toxicity, if you had to think about which one do you think is usually gonna be associated with more toxicity, the biologics or the non-biologics? Typically, the non-biologic have more toxicity associated with them because they're going to be less specific for their how their, their actions are going to be working, as we'll see in a minute. Um, from the non-biologic standpoint, typically, you're going to find methotrexate hydroxychloroquine typically have the best efficacy to toxicity ratios. In fact, a lot of patients end up getting started on one of these two, depending on how severe their disease is as they are first diagnosed, right? And you can find that just by starting a patient out on methotrexate and corticosteroids alone, um, a lot of them are still going to be on therapy that same therapy for, you know, five years or more. Okay, so it can be pretty efficacious in helping to prevent that disease progression and saving those joints there. You may need to use multiple DMARDs together, and we'll talk about what rational use we'll have for those. We'll talk about mixing biologics and non-biologics together, what makes sense, what doesn't make sense. Um, and then for most patients, they're probably gonna start out on methotrexate here, right? Again, it probably has the one we had the best kind of long-term data for. Uh, and it's also kind of a good backbone if you're gonna use a multiple drug regimen. So if I need to mix methotrexate with something else, you're usually gonna get some good synergy there and it's better than just either agent by itself. So um, the traditional DMARDs typically have a slower onset of action. So you may need something like three to six months or so before you really see full effect. Some of the ones that may produce a little bit faster effects include things like methotrexate, which is why it's a good one to start out with, uh, sulfasalazine, which again, we saw that in inflammatory bowel disease and, and leflunamide, usually about one to two months. You can expect to start to see some, some efficacy there. The biologics, much, much faster. Usually within a few weeks, you're gonna find that they're gonna have um, pretty good effects in helping to reduce this patient's symptoms and saving that joint there. Um, however, any of these, are gonna result in immunosuppression. So what do you have to worry about? Infection, is it just bacterial? It could be viral, fungal, maybe parasitic, I don't know. But those are, those are the big ones. Um, then you definitely wanna, especially with the biologic DMARD, you need to test for TB beforehand. Why? You can have latent uh, act, or activation of a latent infection there, right? So you want to test them beforehand, and that's oftentimes going to be a black box warning for a lot of those biologic DMARs. You didn't have to check it beforehand. If you don't, and they end up getting TB, that's kind of your fault, right? Definitely want to check on that. And typically, we'll find that you do want to do vaccines beforehand, because what can happen if I give someone, say, for instance, a live vaccine while they're on this immunosuppressive therapy? They can actually get the disease itself, right? Just like if you had a cancer patient or someone uh, with, with HIV, right? Um, what about for like an inactivated vaccine? Could I still give them that? Would it be a problem? You could, but you probably won't see as full of an effect from it, right? So for instance, I think we had a test question like this. If you had someone who was on, say for instance, uh, immunosuppressive therapy, they need to get the flu vaccine for the year. 
I wouldn't want to give them the flu mist because that was the inactivated form, but I could give them the, I'm sorry, I, could, I don't want to give them flu mist the nasal form because that was the live attenuated. I don't want to give them, uh, I could give them the inactivated form. That would be fine. It just may not get full efficacy, but it's better than nothing, <coughs> right? I don't necessarily want to stop therapy for that because what would happen if I stopped therapy cold turkey off of one of these? <laughs> Probably relapse of their symptoms, right? So you have a disease flare up, have a lot of inflammation, maybe you know end up in the hospital, right? Uh, or for false dose steroids or something like that. So just something to consider. Anyway, uh, uh, so here give the DMARDs or give the vaccines if you can before DMARD therapy starts, if possible, right? So if you can kind of anticipate what they might need, say coming up, even if it's a little early, it's probably going to be okay for for most things. Um, and then you're going to find that killed and recombinant vaccines can be given during therapy. So things like the pneumococcal vaccine, uh, the intramuscular flu vaccine, Hep B are all fine there. But live vaccines are not going to be recommended, just like we talked about. Okay. Um, and in some cases, you may actually recommend certain vaccines a little bit earlier. So, for instance, recommending herpes zoster, say, at 50 instead of 60, right? Because they may be at more risk due to the immunosuppression there. Anyway, so getting into first drug here, methotrexate. So we said, how does it work? dihydrofolate reductase antagonist in more simple terms you could just say the folic acid antagonist right so it prevents your cells from using folic acid effectively so it cannot produce things like purines it cannot produce new dna plus it inhibits cellular re replication what kind of cells get affected most quickly well cells are rapidly dividing your immune cells, hair cells, GI cells, right? All those things can be affected there, right? So we know a lot of the side effects associated with this already um, because we looked at it in terms of things like cancer treatment, right? We've looked at it in terms of things like treatment for inflammatory bowel disease. The same thing happens here. The drug hasn't changed at all. We're just using it for a different disease state. Um, however, if you compare like something like dosing for something like rheumatoid arthritis versus say for cancer, how do you think the dosing compares? A lot lower for something like rheumatoid arthritis, right? Because again, we don't want to make the patient, we don't want to lose all their white cells like we would for something like leukemia. But we're just trying to tamp down the immune system. We're just trying to, to take the edge off so they're not destroying that joint over the long term. Um, so the doses are typically a lot less. Sometimes you're going to see patients on just one time, one time weekly dosing. Sometimes you see just a few times a week. A lot less than you would see for something like acute cancer treatment. And again, just looking at how this is going to be working, kind of uh, working here to inhibit this dihydrofolate reductase enzyme by inhibiting that. They cannot use folic acid, thus you can't produce purines, you can't make new DNA. Remember the term we use for methotrexate? The anti, anti metabolite, right? Because again, this is interrupting this process here, right? We talked about 5-FE was another one that kind of interrupted this process. That's another anti metabolite. Acethiopurine, mercaptopurine, all of those were considered anti metabolites because they interrupt the ability for that cell to make new DNA, right? So the toxicity, we already talked about, bone marrow suppression. You can see GI and oral epithelial ulceration, stomatitis. You can see with that. What, what's the problem with stomatitis? If your mouth is really sore, it's hard to maybe swallow. Maybe you can't get good oral intake. What else could happen? The tissue is being damaged. What grows in your mouth? A lot of gross stuff. You get infections from that, right? A lot of bacteria grow in your mouth, so you get infections from that. So again, good oral hygiene is super important for these patients to do that stomatitis, right? Um, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, obviously you can see that. Uh, hepatotoxicity is another big one. Again, we talk about things you don't want to combine alcohol with. This is a good one because this is a known hepatotoxin. So you definitely don't want to combine those two together if possible. And then things like, you know, pulmonary fibrosis can happen, right? Remember, how does methotrexate get cleared from the body? We talked about how it can cause certain renal effects that can precipitate out. That's why I talked about you get bicarb along with methotrexate to prevent that from occurring there. So you can see that um, acute kidney injury can happen there. So again, you need to have good kidney function to clear methotrexate. Otherwise, you can hold on to it. Levels get too high, get too immunosuppressive, uh, can precipitate out in the kidneys, cause issues there. So you can just be aware that you got to monitor renal function with methotrexate. Okay. Now, what kind of contraindications are we looking at? We'll probably see for sure, because what do you think really needs a lot of rapidly dividing cells? A fetus, perhaps, right? So again, don't get the methotrexate. Actually, methotrexate is used sometimes for chemical abortions, right? So an abortifacient. We do not want to use methotrexate for pregnant women. Again, when does rheumatoid arthritis really kind of kick in? Yeah, it can be during the reproductive years, right? So sometimes it can start in the 30s and 40s. And again, we're moving as a culture more towards having children later. I think my wife just told me a, a study 
or they, they did some kind of survey or something where it's saying that in, uh, in terms of all human history, this is the time we're having the most number of women having children in their 30s, like early 30s time, time frame, right? Because again, a lot of people are waiting until they have their careers underway and things like that to have kids. So again, when you think about these disease states, it may not present until a little bit later on. You, these are things to consider, right? So again, are they of childbearing potential? Do they want to have kids? Do they need to be on oral contraception, et cetera? These are things you want to think about, okay? Um, again, watch out for chronic renal disease and liver disease. Can be a big issue there and then if you have any kind of blood dyscrasias uh, that's going to be worsened by this because we know again it's going to be suppressing reproduction of a lot of those cells uh, again this is the most commonly used one it's fairly effective the toxicity profile is pretty good it's not going to be the lowest toxicity out of the bunch here but it's pretty good fast onset say one to two months or so which is nice um, and again as i mentioned it can be given via several different routes some people will use once weekly im administrations depends on you know, if they can actually uh, do that, you know, if they have the right training to do so, but some people take PO, just, don't, uh, just depends. And then um, as far as monitoring goes, that does make sense, right? So you're looking at things like serum creatinine and see how that's developing over time, looking at their CBCs or LSTs, et cetera. You do want to watch that um, monthly at first, usually for the first six months or so, see how they progress, and then you can start to space it out, right? And obviously pregnancy status, so that's going to be a concern as well. Um, now, some people will give folic acid along with this. Why do you think we do that? Because so it inhibits the use of folic acid. Kind of helps to protect some of those cells that maybe aren't really rapidly dividing so quickly, but they still need folic acid for, say, other purposes. Um, so this kind of helps to spare some of those cells. I don't know that there's any study that says it helps to reduce toxicity definitively, but it's just something we do anyway. Um, and again, something you can get in a lot of multivitamins anyway, which they should probably be taking. Um, but some people will recommend giving a little bit extra for that purpose there. I mean, I guess you could do like one Rockstar Q weekly or something like that. I don't know if it has that much folic acid in it though. Anyone have one that can tell me? No, everyone's drinking water? Fantastic, good job. Okay. Um, up next we have leflunamide. This is another uh, anti-metabolite here. We're gonna find this is decreasing pyrimidine synthesis instead of purine synthesis here. And so it helps to decrease that lymphocyte production. And again, overall it's gonna help to decrease inflammation there. It's actually a prodrug, it actually gets activated by the liver into the active form there. Um, and so you're going to find that it's similar it is pretty similar to methotrexate in terms of toxicity there. Um, still pretty fast onset, you know, within a month or so. So again, this could be another alternative, and methotrexate isn't a good option for those patients there. One thing to note, though, um, is it undergoes enterohepatic recirculation. What is that? You guys remember? It gets spit out through the biliary tract, and then what happens? It gets reabsorbed. And what does that do to the half-life when it goes to that cycling? it extends it pretty long and in fact you can actually find uh months that it takes for the levels to get down to undetectable amounts so who might that be a problem for because again if it's decreasing pyrimidine synthesis affecting dna synthesis do you think it's good for like pregnant patients no probably not and what does someone want to get pregnant they have to wait months might not be really fitting in with their, their lifestyle or what their schedule is, right? So that's something to consider as well. Sometimes what we'll give is actually cholestyramine. Anyone remember where we saw that? It's a bile acid sequestering. It's a hyperlipidemia. That can actually bind it up in the GI tract, interrupt that cycling, and then you just pass it to the feces. Um, so that's one thing you, we can do occasionally called cholestyramine washout, and then you just track levels for that uh, lefalunamide and see where uh, once it gets undetectable, then at that point they can be safe for potentially getting pregnant, right? Um, again, very similar monitoring here, LFT, CBC, pregnancy, all that good stuff, okay? Uh, next up, hydroxychloroquine. This one's probably the weakest out of the non- biologic DMARDs as far as efficacy goes is also going to be the least uh, likely to cause a lot of toxicity. So again, pretty mild. It's good for like disease you can kind of catch pretty early on rather than someone who's already coming, kind of coming with more moderate or severe RA. Um, so again, least toxic, good to start out with someone who's very mild, but again, the efficacy is going to be kind of limited there. Um, it has a couple of different mechanisms. And again, the toxicity being limited makes sense because it's not really working to decrease the reproduction of a lot of these cells, but it's doing things like inhibiting locomotion of the neutrophils, right? It's inhibiting things like chemotaxis of the eosinophils. So that way you're preventing those immune cells from getting to the site, getting to the joint. And by doing that, it's going to help to slow down the progression because again, the inflammatory cells aren't there to get activated and start to chew up that joint there. Response is going to be a little delayed, two to four months or so. Again, it's not really associated with myelosuppression. You're not really going to see hepatotoxicity, no renal insufficiency. It's great from that standpoint because there's not a whole lot of monitoring as compared to something like methotrexate. But again, overall, the efficacy is going to be a little bit limited as compared to something like a methotrexate.
Some things you can see with it, um, do you want to monitor for visual acuity, both at baseline and then follow-up, because you can actually develop a retinopathy here, so you do want to be careful with that. Um, and obviously, if they have any kind of like changes in vision they notice, like they probably need to stop therapy immediately, can get checked out. And then some things you can see is some of this increased skin pigmentation, kind of a graying sort of uh, the skin. So you do want to uh, watch out for that and just let them know, hey, that's a normal effect to see with more chronic therapy. If it's something they don't want to deal with, then maybe that's not the right drug for them. Uh, next, we have sulfasalazine. We talked about this before because we know it's going to be one that gets actually gets uh, to pro drug. It's going to be activated by the colonic bacteria, so it turns into sulfapyridine and 5-aminosalicylic acid. So again, that can be absorbed and have its anti-inflammatory actions. Um, again, response is pretty variable, but say within one to four months or so. Uh, but by doing this, uh, by having that salicylate in there, along with the sulfapyridine, it's going to help to modulate some of those inflammatory mediators, hopefully to tamp that down. And then it also kind of inhibits TNF-alpha, right? Maybe not as significantly as something like a monoclonal antibody would, but still has some, some good effects there and can act as a free radical scavenger. So it'll pick up some of those react reactive oxygen species and prevent them from damaging the joint further. Then we see some patients are going to, uh, a significant number of them will develop some side effects here. So, of course, nausea vomiting to be expected. Um, but do you want to watch LFTs there? You see some alopecia associated with this as well. Um, but generally, you're going to be kind of treating up to a point. So, you start with lower doses, to kind of titrate up to see what they can tolerate, uh, and then go, go from there, right? Typically, don't see a lot of leukopenia or thrombocytopenia. It's possible, but it's pretty rare as compared to something like, you know, methotrexate, so less risk with that. Um, and just be aware that there's a lot of drug interactions seen with this. So whether it be, um, say, for instance, iron supplements or antibiotics being bound up by this or potentially warfarin, this is actually a protein interaction. Um, but again, we're using warfarin less and less nowadays, so this may be less of a clinical concern for some of your patients there. And also, it's going to turn your urine to stool, yellow or orange. So you do want to let people know that because, again, if you saw an orange in orange kind of tinge to your urine, what are you thinking, potentially? You could think blood, potentially, you know, maybe if it's, I don't know, it has like orange blood, but, you know, if I saw the color change like that, I didn't know any better, I would think maybe, oh, something's not right here. So I want to let them know that, make sure they're, they're aware of it. Okay, and then uh, the last one in this category is going to be tofacitinib or zelgans. This one will consider non-biologic, um, and this is the newest out of the bunch. It's very specific targeting, though, right? So instead of affecting things like, you know, overall replication of immune cells. This is uh, specifically targeting a tyrosine kinase receptor, okay? And so basically what you're gonna find is that this is good for both moderate or severe RA, um, and it usually uses as a backup once they kind of fail methotrexate, okay? So they've kind of failed non-biologic DMAR therapies. This is a good one to, to go to. And basically it's working as a JAK inhibitor or Janus kinase inhibitor. And basically it's gonna be this protein here, and you can see it right here interacting with uh, interleukin-2 once this gets activated, these JAK proteins will be activated, and then that goes down and will then cause gene transcription to occur for a lot of these inflammatory mediators. So by inhibiting this, by inhibiting these proteins here, you're going to be preventing, even though they get activated by IL-2, you're preventing the proteins from activating these STAT proteins, and thus that transcription never happens. Okay, so again, very specific for their targets. So they're going to be associated with a lot less um, side effects than something like methotrexate and tends to be pretty effective, uh, usually on comparable to some of the monoclonal antibodies and other biologic DMARDs. Uh, the other nice thing here as well, it's very powerful as a drug, but it's also available orally, which is something that has kind of a one-up on over things like um, the monoclonal antibodies that have to be injectables. Um, this can either be used as a monotherapy or it can be potentially used in combination with other drugs, so you can see some synergy there. However, it's not recommended that you use this with biologics. Anyone know why? Typically causes way too much immune suppression. The risk for infection becomes too high. I do not want to make the combination of those two. However, if I needed to use this with methotrexate or other non-biologics, that's going to be a good combination. We'll talk about combination therapy a little bit later on and what, what makes sense from that standpoint. Um, if they have a severe renal dysfunction, you may need to adjust the dose a little bit. Or if they have hepatic dysfunction, you may need to adjust the dose. But definitely, if they have any other CA, uh, CYP3A4 inhibitors on board, you need to adjust that. Okay. So again, if they had something like verapamil on board, or say, for instance, like uh, erythromycin, something that inhibits 3 4 you're going to have to drop your dose some of this one. Otherwise, you could see too much myelosuppression there. Okay. Um, this is another one you definitely want to test for latent TB for. So you can think about, uh, and this is why I kind of lump it in with the biologics, even though it's not technically biologic, because, again, it has similar efficacy, similar warnings and whatnot. But definitely test for latent TB. And then, obviously, they're going to have black box warning for things like serious infections, possible risk for lymphomas, and some other malignancies. Okay. Any questions so far?
All right, let's do a 10 minute break. We'll come back and get into the biologics. All right, any questions from the first half? Everyone seems a little low energy today. I don't know what it was. Maybe the sim yesterday took some of it out of you, a little emotionally draining. Perhaps the test today. Could be the test today. Or it could be the note tomorrow. Or it could just be me. Like, let's just face it. It could be me. It's not you. It's me. But um, So in that case, I will tell one more quick joke. If you'd like to hear it. All right. So uh, there were two hunters. And so we want to go moose hunting. They have this annual trip they do. Uh, so they went and they chartered a public or a private pilot to fly them up into Canada over the mountains and go hunt moose. By the end of it, they had a very successful trip. They bagged six, six moose, meese, mooses, whatever. They bagged six of them. And so they went back to the pilot and said, hey, let's load them up. Let's take them back. And the pilot goes, there's no way we can carry all six of these carcasses. We can only carry four. Otherwise, the plane's not going to have enough power. It's not going to be good. So the two hunters go, well, listen, last year, the pilot told us that we could take all six. <laughs> and so the guy's like, uh, and they're like, it's the same plane as last year. And the guy's like, all right, fine, we'll do it. We'll do it. So they load up all six of them, flying over the mountain. Sure enough, plane didn't have enough power, goes down, crashes. There's moose carcasses everywhere. The pilot's dead, but the two hunters survive. And so Billy Bob looks over at Jimbo and goes, man. Well, where do you think we're at? The other one goes, well, probably the same place we crashed last year. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> the moral of the story, you should always ask questions about why you do things the way you do, because there's oftentimes not always a good reason, or there could be a bad reason why you do it, and it's time to make a change. Anyway, so getting into the biologic DMARDs, again, we've kind of covered monoclonal antibodies before, but just in case anyone needs a refresher, remember these are antibodies that we've generated. Remember, that some of them can be humanized, some of them can be chimeric. <laughs> typically, what kind of proteins are we using? If they're not human, they are typically usually mouse protein, right? Murine protein. And again, which ones are more likely to see anaphylactic reactions? The more mouse protein you have in there, the more for foreign it is, the more likely you are to have those reactions there, right? So if you had something that was purely just uh, murine protein, and again, this kind of goes into the name. So if you see like something OMAB, that would mean it's just purely murine protein. You're more likely to see a lot of those interactions, right? So if you look at, and again, the two big ones I'll talk about is adalimumab versus rituximab or infliximab. Infliximab obviously is going to be one of these chimeric ones. You're more likely to see anaphylactic reactions to infliximab than you would be to something like adalimumab, umab, because that's all human protein. So to give you an idea of how that clinically makes a difference, for infliximab or rituximab, we have to bring patients into the infusion center to give this to them so we can monitor them, make sure they don't have an anaphylactic reaction versus something like adalimumab, a fully human one, they can take it at home. They can inject it. They're relatively unlikely to have an anaphylactic reaction because it's a protein their body recognizes as, as its own, right? Uh, so again, that's kind of, kind of the big clinical differences you'll find with those. And when, again, that's why we look at uh, anaphylactic reactions as being a possible side effect of these drugs. Um, these are very effective, probably more effective in some cases than some of the non-biologic DMARDs. They can also have some synergy when combining the two together. But again, one of the big drawbacks for these monoclonal antibodies is they are pretty expensive, right? So for instance, um, with our uh, Humira, we use for some of our kids with Crohn's or ulcerative colitis. Um, you know, we have a program set up where we actually, we get the drug for free for the first dose. And then I mean, like any good drug dealer, the first hit's always free and then you got to pay. So then the drug company will work with them after they get discharged and make sure they can keep on with it. So they have a lot, a lot of, um, you know, coupon like kind of programs and things like that, but a lot of work with the insurance companies to make sure it gets covered. A lot of prior authorizations you might have to go through if you work with these patients and working with these drugs. A lot of hoops you have to uh, go through in order to make sure it gets covered, right? Because otherwise, if they're paying for it themselves, it can be way too much and, and probably not going to be able to pay for it. Versus like methotrexate, it's been around for decades and decades, super cheap, right, in comparison. But the other big benefit with these. Very little monitoring. You don't have to worry about renal function. You don't have to worry about monitoring for LFTs. You don't have to watch the CBC necessarily. Very, very nice from that standpoint as far as monitoring goes. Kind of like when moving from like warfarin up to some like ribaroxaban. Like there's no PTI and R monitoring. It's just so much easier to dose. You don't have to worry about it. Similar for these uh, biologic DMARDs. However, there's that increased risk for infection. It's typically higher than what you're going to find with something like a methotrexate. Typically, it's a black box warning associated with these. You got to check for TB beforehand. Um, and again, you do not want to give live vaccines along with therapy with these biologic DMARDs. Okay, give them before, give them a few months after. 
you know, inactivated ones are fine, but they may not be as effective as, as it would be otherwise. Um, they all have pretty similar side effects between them, even though their mechanism might differ a little bit. Um, just know, especially with um, infliximab and tandercept, these two in particular might be a little bit worse for patients with cardiovascular histories, especially with CHF. They tend to cause a little bit more edema. There has been some deaths associated with these, so you would want to avoid infliximab and tandercept with those patients, especially if they have a reduced ejection fraction, you know, stage three or four, class three or four uh, heart failure, you probably want to avoid it for those patients. And then if they have concomitant MS, which is a possibility because, again, it's another autoimmune sort of condition there. Um, in some cases, those may actually exacerbate those symptoms, right? So sometimes you have a little bit of a flare-up there. Uh, if that does happen, then you may need to discontinue it depending on, on what the case may be. Um, and again, there is a black box warning for both the TB risk and also for things like lymph flow proliferative cancers. Now, I'll go through a couple of different ones. Now, just note that if you watch TV on any given day, I don't know how many of your cord cutters, but I don't have cable, but whenever I go to my parents' house, they usually have it on like either Food Network or what's the other show they watch? Like Animal Planet, some kind of Animal Planet variant where it's a lot of like so-and-so Western medicine or so-and-so like Yukon medicine or something like that. It's a lot of vet shows. Um, but anyway, whenever they watch those TV shows, there's a ton of commercials for all these different monoclonal antibodies. You're going to find a million of them. So this is not an all-inclusive list. This is just to get you familiar with some of the more common ones you may run into, but just know there's new ones coming out all the time, right? Because again, these are potential big money makers because uh, they are treating a condition that, you know, previously did not have, you know, the, the most effective therapy or had a lot of risk associated with it. Anyway, Tanner is the first one I'm going to talk about here. Inbril is a band, uh, brand name. And what you actually find is it will inhibit tumor necrosis factor by basically looking like two tumor necrosis factor receptors kind of linked together. So basically by taking the FC portion of the antibody and then linking it to these two receptors that basically looks like what TNF would normally bind to. By binding to it, then it inactivates it essentially, so it can't go and activate other things like T cells, right? Um, again, typically you can combine a biologic with a non-biologic, so you can get some extra synergy there. Now, do you think I can, can combine two biologics together? That you do not want to do, okay? So I do not want to put infliximab plus a tandercept. Those you don't want to do, but a non-biologic plus a biologic totally makes sense. And there might be a question on the test that will ask you which one of these combinations makes therapeutic sense. And that's something you want to be able to pick out. Okay. Anyway, typically the biologists tend to be more of a second line sort of DMARC because, again, if you can get away with cheaper therapy, that's always going to be more beneficial for, from a patient uh, care standpoint. Um, and again, most of these are going to be given you know, subcutaneously or IV, depending on how it's going to be given. And usually the half life for these drugs are a lot longer than for the non-biologic DMAR, so you don't have to give them as frequently. So in some cases, you may only have to give it every two weeks. Sometimes it could be every few months. Just depends on the drug and what the dosing is going to look like. But typically, just know they have a good long half life. The patient does not need to receive these very frequently, the case may be. Um, again, just know whenever you're injecting something, you could have some injection site reactions important to make sure you clean the area, otherwise you could see the infection there. Uh, and again, costs pretty expensive, right? There's certainly more expensive drugs that are out there, but 15,000 a year, pretty expensive, right? Uh, next, we have infliximab. This is another very common one. Again, this is a chimeric protein. So that's how you can tell with the X in there, kind of mixing the mouse and the human proteins together. Um, very good by actually binding up and targeting that tumor necrosis factor and decreasing the inflammation via that route. Um, again, good as a second line sort of therapy. If they're failing biologic, or non-biologic therapy and they need something else, it's a good kind of second line sort of agent for them to be administered. Um, and again, just you, know, you see some of that synergy there, you can mix it with lalunamide, methotrexate, and they definitely find some good synergy between those two um, when you're mixing these together. Um, and in fact, in some cases, you may actually find that if I keep injecting these proteins over and over in the long term, what could happen to the body's reaction to those proteins? I mentioned anaphylaxis as a risk. What could be like a lesser sort of uh, reaction to those? We could produce antibodies against those antibodies, and then you actually can inactivate them, okay? So you may actually find that the bodies that are trying to inactivate those foreign proteins may not be like a full anaphylactic reaction, but they still become less effective. So what we can actually do is by giving methotrexate along with something like infliximab, it actually helps to decrease formation of those antibodies, and it helps to keep the infliximab working for longer than it would be otherwise. Now, can your body do something like that to methotrexate? Well, no, it's too small of a molecule. We can't really generate antibodies against that. However, um, this does provide some benefit to patients on infliximab. It helps to keep the drug more active for longer, which is great. And just to give you an idea, I'm not going to ask you the dosing specifically, but you can see here that initially you'll kind of give it, say, at week zero, 
two weeks, six weeks. And after that, you can give it every eight weeks or so. So every two months, it'd have to come back. Again, nice long half-life when you have these proteins being used here. And again, looking at the injection, how you're actually going to give it, um, you have to infuse it over two hours. If you fuse it much faster than that, you actually end up finding a lot of uh, anaphylactoid sort of reactions to that. Now, if they had a reaction, how could I manage that? So say they're getting it and they're starting to get, oh, I'm starting to get kind of achy, some chills, try to temperature, it's a little elevated. Well, they still need the drug. It's some mild reaction. The patient's kind of uncomfortable. So Benadryl could be good for some of the reactions, especially to get like itching and any kind of flushing, things like that could be good. What about if they're having like some fever associated with this? Acetaminophen is a good one, right? So you can pre-treat with acetaminophen. Sometimes you'll pre-treat with things like Benadryl beforehand and help out with that. What if they start to have an actual acute reaction? So blood pressure starts to get a little low. They're feeling like the throat, throat is closing up. Epi, what else? What else would you use in anaphylaxis? Steroid, right? Corticosteroids are also going to be very important there as well. So anytime you're giving something like this, infliximab, you always want to make sure you have anaphylactic meds ready to go if you need it, right? So again, how would you write orders like that, do you think? Well, it'd be, is it, would you say, let's give epi, so again, you're writing orders before the patient even gets there. You say epi once. No, they don't necessarily need epi, right? You say epi once PRN. PRN what? anaphylaxis, right? So that gives the nurses the ability to pull that med if they need it, but if they don't need it, then it just stays on the order, just stays on their profile. They don't ever have to, to use that medication there. But again, typically you want to see that that once PRN or say on call, sometimes you'll see that in, in the medical record systems where that way the nurse has the ability to grab the meds because do you want the patient to have an anaphylactic reaction and then the nurse has to call you up and you're at lunch and you're kind of busy and they leave a message and then you call back up and say, hey, what's going on? And they're like, oh, he, he died 30 minutes ago. He couldn't get any meds. No, they usually wouldn't progress to that, but you want to make sure you have the orders on the profile beforehand whenever using something that has a high propensity to cause anaphylaxis, okay? So again, it's going to include antihistamines, steroids. What's a good IV steroid you can use? Methylprednisolone is a good one. Hydrocortisone is another good one you can use. Dexamethasone could be another potential one. Methylpred and hydrocortisone are probably the most common ones that I see being used there for these purposes. And then, so epi, benadryl, corticosteroids. As far as pre-treatment goes, if they know they've had an infusion reaction before, give them some Benadryl, give them some Tylenol, that's totally fine. Okay. Does that kind of make sense? So again, you want them to have all that stuff ready, so that way they're not having to scramble when they actually do have a reaction. They already know, hey, I got epi on the profile, I can go grab the epi out of the machine, answer to the patient, and they're good to go. And then they can call you up, hey, can you come check this patient out? I just had to give them some epi. You know, yeah, I'll be right there, right? Make sense? Um, next, we have adalimumab. This one, again, because it's more human-based protein, this can actually be something the patients will pick up from the pharmacy, take home, and administer themselves. It comes in a, a pin formation where basically they just put a pin needle onto it and inject it subcutaneously uh, with that. But again, what's one of the problems with rheumatoid arthritis? Giving yourself a pin injection. Well, they got to be able to have the actual dexterity to do so. And again, if their thumb joints are, are deformed enough where they can't actually use the pin, it can be, become difficult, right? So either someone else has to give it to them, or it just may not be a good drug for them, depending on what's going on. But similar mechanism of action to something like infliximab, it's going to be working against that tumor necrosis factor, decrease that inflammation, all very similar um, risk, probably less anaphylactic risk, we just know it's still there. Um, same risk for infections, et cetera, okay? This one's every other week, subcutaneously. So again, nice long half-life, not very frequent administration. Still very expensive, though. Uh, next, we have a bad set. This one's a little bit different. So instead of working against tumor necrosis factor specifically, this is actually working against, uh, it's called a co-stimulation modulator. And so we're basically working against some of these CD receptors. It kind of prevents communication between these different cells. So if these antigen presenting cells can never go and activate the T cells, then you decrease that inflammation overall, right? So just a different flavor of, of uh, mechanism. Um, instead of binding the actual cytokine itself, it actually binds to the cells to prevent them from being activated in the first place. Um, again, similar uh, side effects, risk for anaphylaxis for sure, injection site reactions, etc. But again, nothing too different with that. Again, monitoring, very minimal monitoring, which is great. Any of the monoclonal antibodies have very limited monitoring, which is very nice from that standpoint. Um, when you use this, could be if you have patients who are failing TNF alpha inhibitor therapy, so maybe they were work, working with infliximab, but it's kind of stopped working over time, and you switch to something else, this is where a bad step could come into play. Okay.
Uh, then we have rituximab. This is also similar similar to uh, previously, we're actually going to be targeting a CD receptor. So it's actually a CD20 receptor. Now, you actually, in some cases, you'll see this being used. We probably talked about it briefly in terms of cancer. This can sometimes be used for certain types of uh, leukemia. We see that occasionally. Uh, but again, these are actually working against the B lymphocytes, preventing them from being activated there. Again, useful if patients have kind of failed other therapies. Again, anaphylactic risk is pretty high with this one because it is chimeric, just like we saw with infliximab. Um, and, and most of the time, patients do definitely need to be pretreated. So give them Tylenol, give them... Benadryl, and a lot of patients actually get steroids beforehand just to make sure we kind of prevent any reaction from happening in the first place. So you'll see them get a, a big dose of methylprednisolone beforehand. Also, the benefit of methylprednisolone for RA is what? It's anti-inflammatory, right? So it's going to be able to deal with some of the inflammation they're having anyway. And so again, you're kind of pulling some double duty with that as the case may be. Okay. Anyway, um, but again, similar with other biologics, you can use this along with other non-biologic DMARDs and it helps to get some extra synergy out of that. Uh, moving to a different mechanism here, we have tocilizumab or Actemra. I'm actually starting to see a lot, a lot of patients getting put on Actemra. This is actually working against interleukin-6. I think you know interleukin-6 is another, similar to TNF-alpha, is another inflammatory cytokine. If we can inhibit that, again, that's going to inhibit that inflammation. Um, again, again, it's very useful if patients are kind of failing TNF-alpha inhibitors. It's a good kind of backup agent, too. In fact, I'm starting to see more and more patients are kind of moving towards just using this um, as a first line for some of our kids with like JRA and other uh, autoimmune conditions there. Um, this one's kind of interesting, though. This one actually induces CYP3A4, so you do want to be careful there. Because, again, uh, if you think about, you know, patients on methotrexate and tocilizumab, or Actimra, and say, for instance, they're on oral contraceptives to prevent pregnancy, and this is inducing 3A4, it's going to increase the metabolism of the estrogen, and what can happen? They can ovulate, and then they potentially get pregnant, right? And that's obviously not what you want to have happen. So just be aware of that. Make sure you're looking for the drug interactions beforehand. Depends on the patient and what other concomitant disease states they have. Um, now, again, looking at this, you can find that patients, when they're on biologics, can either have what they call a primary lack of efficacy, where basically after a three to six months of therapy, you don't really see any improvements in symptoms, and there, or they can have what we call a secondary lack of efficacy. And that's usually where you're going to find that the body is generating antibodies against those drugs and making them ineffective. So they seem effective at first, but then they lose efficacy. That could be what you end up seeing with that. Or they could just come off of it based off of adverse effects. So the infusion reactions are too severe, they just can't bother uh, receiving that. Um, and so that oftentimes can lead to discontinuation there. In some cases, you can get some additional efficacy out of adding on a non-biologic. So maybe they were on, uh, you know, infliximab, sort of lose some efficacy, add on methotrexate, and now it's working a little bit better for them. That could be something you could try there. Um, and again, maybe try switching up between different mechanisms. So if you were on infliximab, TNF-alpha inhibitor, that's not working anymore, switch over to IL-6 inhibitor. Makes less sense to go from infliximab to Adelimumab because they have the same mechanism essentially. So again, usually try to switch up the mechanism in these cases if one fails. Um, and then combining two biologics together is a no-go. Combining Zeljans, like tofacitinib, with a biologic is a no-go either, right? Too much um, uh, immune suppression, too big a risk for infection happens there, okay? But non-biologic plus a biologic, it's a good combination. Now, corticosteroids, we mentioned, we know they're immunosuppressive, we know they're going to be anti-inflammatory basically from the top of the pyramid down because they're working at the site of the nucleus, right? And they're affecting gene transcription there. Uh, so very good, very potent. However, we know there's a lot of side effects such as... Hmm? Speak up. Like, immunosuppression, right? What else? Glucose issues. What kind of glucose issues? Hyperglycemia. Does that mean glucose? We got issues, right? It's complicated if we had a relationship. Muscle wasting, decreased bone density, so osteoporosis can be exacerbated here. Weight gain, edema, all kinds of problems, right? So again, again, we'd like to get these patients off of them if possible, but first, uh, especially with those flare-ups, corticosteroids are king, uh, or queen, as the case may be. Um, and definitely some patients may just need chronic therapy with, uh, with something like prednisone every day to help kind of maintain a good uh, kind of constant anti-inflammatory reaction. So again, uh, they tried... You know, some patients with chronic therapy, they try every other day therapy to try to limit the side effects. This really isn't all that effective there. Um, and in some patients, you may actually use it as bridge therapy. When I say bridge therapy, what do you think that means? Yeah, use it until something else becomes more efficacious, right? So again, if I had a patient with a new diagnosis and they're already coming with, say, moderate symptoms, I can use the corticosteroids initially to decrease that inflammation and allow something like methotrexate to kick in. Because we said, how long does that take to, to start to work? Mm 
couple of months, right? You know, they're already having symptoms right now. I'm going to decrease those symptoms immediately with corticosteroids and then allow the methotrexate to work in one to two months. And then as that starts to kick in, then I can start to taper off the steroids. Because again, when do I need to taper steroids? After a week or so, right? Then at that point, you need to start to taper. Otherwise, you can develop adrenal insufficiency, right? Because again, by supplying exogenous corticosteroids, what does your adrenal glands say? Hey, our job here is done. We got enough corticosteroids. I'm going to take a vacation. See you, kidneys. No, so they, they start to atrophy, right? And so again, they take some time to kick back into production. So you have to taper. They've been on it for more than a week or so, which is definitely could happen here. They could be on for several months. They could be on it you know, for several years, as the case may be, right? They're also useful to have a flare-up. You can use this kind of pulse dose store steroids to try to get that inflammation back down. It can be useful. Um, some cases you may use it intramuscularly. You can sometimes use what we call depot forms. When I say depot, what does that mean? Think of depot or depot. What do you think? If I go to, I don't know, what's a good depot store? Home Depot, there you go. Boy, that just totally flew my mind. I was like, there's a hardware store, like a Lowe's Depot? No, that's not right. <laughs> the Home Depot, what is the Home Depot? It's a big stockpile of a bunch of home stuff, right? Same thing happens here. You're giving an intramuscular injection of a drug that sticks there for a while. Usually it's in an oil base, and it, takes a, it slowly leaches into the systemic circulation. So just like we have like depo shots, which you normally think about as far as being oral contraceptive, not oral, uh, contraceptives, um, same thing happens here. So you have long acting corticosteroids that can be injected into the muscle and they will slowly leach out over time, right? So just a supply of drug, it's gonna last a while. It's one thing you can do, um, you know, in some cases that it helps to mitigate that taper because again, the levels will drop down naturally on their own. They kind of build the taper in it in itself, essentially, which is nice. And in some cases, you may actually use intraarticular injections. So specifically, if there are like a few joints, you know, a few one or two joints that are specifically being affected more so than the others, um, this is, can be very useful. Okay, this uh, what do you think is the benefit of intraarticular injections? Works pretty fast, but yeah, it limits the uh, systemic exposure, right? So you don't have to worry about the glucose issues. You don't have to worry about the immunosuppression as much. Some of it may leach into the systemic circulation, but not nearly the amount you would see if you're given it orally or intramuscularly, et cetera. Um, however, you do not want to do more than two to three administrations per year. So this is better for like an acute flare-up every once in a while, right? So it's kind of like, um, you know, uh, sometimes treat, not an everyday sort of treat, right? Kind of thing, if you think about it like that. Um, because if you have too much of that, corticosteroid action directly in the joint, you can end up seeing uh, tendon atrophy, you can end up seeing joint destruction actually being increased over time. So again, um, not great for that, but very good for kind of acute sort of um, symptomatic management. Okay, obviously the lowest dose use, uh, possible should be used. Um, and again, it could be useful. It has some disease modifying a uh, aspects to it. You know, it can sometimes slow the progression, but we're not really using it for that. It's really using it for more um, symptomatic sort of management here. And the idea is if you can wean them off of it, it's always going to be prefer preferable. And again, we've talked about the adverse effects. There are many, many numerous ones. We've kind of talked about the more common ones. Okay. Objective for NSAIDs. You, know, you guys already know a lot about NSAIDs, right? We already talked about them all. So again, we have selective NSAIDs. We have non-selective NSAIDs. What's an example of a selective one? Celecoxib or Celebrax. What are some non-selective ones that we think kind of have some selectivity? Meloxicam is a good example. Nebumatone is another good example there, right? So again, who is a good candidate for COX-2 inhibitor? They have a history of GI issues, right? They have a history of GI ulcers, especially in sed induced GI ulcers. It's a good option there. Who are they bad for? Probably avoid them in high risk cardiac patients, right? If I had a patient with both, what do I do? So you say, yeah, so before I said, we'll just give them Tylenol, right? Does that really work for rheumatoid arthritis? Not really, right? So again, that becomes a little bit more of a sticky wicket, so to speak. Um, and so you may need to rely more on things like corticosteroids. You may need to look at um, trying to maybe minimize the dose a little bit to try to mitigate the GI effects, balance it versus the cardiac effects, you know? So again, it is going to be very much on a case-by-case -case basis. If you talk to a rheumatologist, intent, we have one here, um, they may give you, you know, depending on what type of patient, and we have a different answer for each one of them, right? So again, very dependent there. Um, but again, working by inhibiting cyclooxygenase, decreasing the inflammation. And again, we know COX-2 is the inducible or constitutive version. COX-2 is inducible, right? So it's being induced quite a bit here for these patients with RA. Anyway, so again, um, 
Um, NSAIDs are good as either adjunctive treatment to analgesics for osteoarthritis, or sometimes they can just be used by themselves. So sometimes you have patients with OA who are getting, say, acetaminophen plus NSAIDs. Even though acetaminophen is not really good for RAs, but they tend to be more for cornerstone therapy for RA there. So you're definitely going to see a lot of patients on chronic NSAIDs there. And again, as far as NSAIDs go, you know, what are some other considerations we're going to make there? You know, so in regards of kinetics of the NSAIDs, what are you considering? If you know they're going to take this every single day, chronically, do you want them to take it multiple times a day? No, something like ibuprofen. How often do you take ibuprofen? A lot, every six hours, every six to eight hours, right? So it's not really good that convenient, right? So using some of the longer half life, something like you know um, Daypro or something like that, you know something like uh, that only has to give maybe once or twice a day is going to be beneficial, right? We want to reduce the pill burden, reduce how often they're going to take medications here, and try to make sure they're not having to constantly go back and get you know another dose of drugs, another dose of drugs, right? Little things to think about, right? Um, and again, COX two inhibitors should be reserved for those patients with a high risk GI history. Okay, um, again, just kind of talking about that. We've kind of covered this ad nauseum, so I'm hoping that you're going to be the first class that we don't run into this great debate over. Every single year, someone has a problem with COX-2 inhibitors, and they'll get a question on a test and come up and they say, but you said, I was like, I know what I said about this situation. The test had this situation. They get very confounded, but that's okay. Um, so if you have questions, let me know, but basically that's, that's the gist of it. High-risk cardiac history, try to avoid instances if you can, but if not, use an non-selective one, high-risk GI history. Use a COX-2 inhibitor, right? Okay, so looking at the algorithm, so how you would actually manage these patients with RA. So let's say they're DMARD naive. They're like, what's a DMARD, right? It's naive. But, you know. um, so let's say they never received a DMARD before, really what I'm referring to. Um, they say low to high disease activity, right? So you kind of catch them early on in the disease process. Notice here, you start with a DMARD plus or minus prednisone. And again, prednisone here is really being used as more bridge therapy, right? So you're decreasing that inflammation with the, uh, the prednisone. Um, methotrexate tends to be preferred for most patients early on, right? Because again, pretty good efficacy to the toxicity profile, relatively cheap, you know, especially in comparison to the monoclonal antibodies, good from that standpoint. Let's say they are having more moderate to high disease activity here, this is where you can consider combinations, right? So you could either use, um, uh, you know, combination DMARDs, such as a tumor necrosis factor inhibitor plus or minus methotrexate, right? So you could go with the biologic by itself, that's more severe, or you can use a combination of the two together. So infliximab plus methotrexate, or I could use adalimumab plus uh, hydroxychloroquine or something, some combination like that uh, could be useful there. And notice here you could use tofacitinib plus or minus methotrexate, but notice you're not going to use a biologic plus tofacid if you don't want to combine those two together because, again, too much immunosuppression happens with that, all right? And then based off of that, based how they respond to it, you know, uh, they have a single tumor necrosis factor inhibitor. Well, then you can try something that's a non-tumor necrosis factor inhibitor. So if I gave you a test question, I said, hey, this patient was on, you know, infliximab uh, and they're on methotrexate together, but the infliximab just isn't really working anymore. What do you want to switch them over to? And if I said adalimumab, you say that's not the right answer because... That is not a biologic, or it's a biologic that inhibits tumor necrosis factor. It's not a good one. Maybe I can go to something like tocilizumab or actimera because that's an IL-6 inhibitor, right? So switch up the mechanisms. Being able to recognize those is going to be important for testing purposes, right? Um, and then again, if they are still failing therapy, this one, you're just going to try a different option, right? Just go with a different mechanism. If they haven't tried tofacitinib yet, Try that out. See how it's going to respond with them. Again, you can still keep those non-biologic DMARDs on board to try to help keep a little bit of that synergy there with them. Okay. All the while they're having a flare-up, prednisone can be very useful there. Very severe flare-ups, you can try using parenteral steroids. Just depends on the patient. So again, looking at the combinations, you can definitely use two non-biologics together. Totally fine. I can use a biologic and a non-biologic together. Totally fine. What I do not want to do is mix tofacitinib plus a biologic, and I don't want to put two biologics together. That's the gist of it. Make sense? Also, another caveat to that, you don't want to mix methotrexate plus leflunamide. There's actually a very high risk for hepatotoxicity, so you don't want to mix those two together. But like methotrexate plus hydroxychloroquine, totally fine, right? Um, those would be a fine combination there. Make sense? All right. Um, you can look at the combination of uh, non-biologics plus biologics. Again, you can see what would be good options here. Um, as I mentioned, you know, methotrexate is probably the most common combination of the non-biologic you're going to see with that, um, just because it's been around for a good long time. We have the most efficacy and, and most evidence for its use. Okay. 
So moving on, so we still talked about acetaminophen not being really good for RA, but we definitely know that it's going to be sort of a cornerstone of therapy for osteoarthritis. It tends to be less effective than NSAIDs, but also the benefit is it has less toxicity associated with it. Really, what's the big toxicity you think of the acetaminophen? Hepatotoxicity, right? Again, these patients may be taking it chronically, especially with osteoarthritis, um, so you need to be able to monitor for that, right? So again, ask them, hey, you know, how much do they drink? You know, how often? Because you know, they are a chronic drinker that can predispose them to toxicity from acetaminophen. Then we know what CYP enzyme the alcohol actually ramps up? Actually, 2E1. And 2E1 is actually what makes the toxic metabolite of acetaminophen. So those patients tend to be more prone to toxicity, they may need to drop their dose down. Normally, we say what's the max dose they want to receive in a day? Four grams. You may need to drop it down to something like, you know, 3250 or three grams, whatever the case may be, right? So again, you want to consider what their, um, what other hepatotoxins they may have on board, what their liver function is like, et cetera, okay? Other things we can try, we have topical NSAIDs. This is good for patients that have relatively uh, few number of joints are being affected here. This is good for like OA, especially if it's like one particular knee that gets affected. Um, and so uh, Voltaren gel is the most common one you're probably gonna run into. There's also some aspirin-based products. Those you can find over the counter, Voltaren is still prescription only here in the US. Again, the benefit of topical therapy is low systemic toxicity. The downside is it's only gonna work where you put it, right? So again, when I strain my back, put it around the back, works great there. Did it deal with any of the muscle soreness out anywhere else? No, right? So the oral ibuprofen was good for it. I combined the two together, don't tell anyone. If I survived, it was okay. Anyway. Um, so that's a benefit, right? So again, this is good, especially for older patients, especially those that are greater than 75, where NSAIDs may not be a good option for them, right? And why are NSAIDs not a great option for those older than 75? Renal toxicity could be a big one. What else? Maybe more predisposed to GI toxicity. So again, things you want to consider, okay? Capsaicin is also another really good one we can use. What do we say about capsaicin you want to tell patients to do? Yeah, use it uh, very um, uh, consistently. Some may say religiously, right? What else? Got to wash your hands. Absolutely. Right. Soap and water. You can't just run under some water and say, oh, they're washed now. No, soap and water because you got to get all the capsaicin off there. It's very oily based. Um, again, useful in con uh, conjunction with other things as well. Use it along with analgesics, use it along with NSAIDs, totally fine there. Uh, and there's some other things you can use as well, like counter irritants. These are like your muscle rub creams and things like, you know, Bengay and um, what are some other ones? I can't think of the names now. There's a lot of over the counter ones, but usually like, you know, menthol, camphor, things like that. What is Shaq usually? Icy hot, that's the one. Yeah, icy hot. Shaq likes icy hot. Um, <laughs> the weird associations I make based off commercials, showing just how well they work, right? Um, anyway, but yeah, so using some counter irritants like menthol, camphor, oil, wintergreen, things like that, it kind of draws, um, it kind of causes that cold heat sort of sensation there uh, that can help out with some of the pain as well. Again, only is worth working where you apply it, only working while you're actually using the product. Okay. Anyway, um, and again, intraarticular corticosteroids can be useful for osteoarthritis as well, but the same caveat applies. You can only use it a few times a year. Uh, otherwise, you can see increased joint destruction, um, tendon atrophy, et cetera. Okay. Now, opioids. When should you use opioids for osteoarthritis? Ideally, never. But sometimes you have to, right? Sometimes your NSAIDs, uh, they may not be a good candidate for NSAIDs. You see the minifin not cutting it. I think I was cutting it in. A lot of times these patients will develop um, a need for opioids. Again, try to use the lowest dose possible. Try to limit how long you're going to have to use it for. Try to only use it for a sort of um, pulse dosing, you know, sort of if they're having a flare up, it's great. But some patients are going to require chronic therapy, so you should be aware of that. Um, when I talked about the house bills, anyone remember what I said you have to do in order to fill? If you have a patient who's taking it chronically, say every single day, to get a month's worth, what do you have to put on there? Did I mention that? Because normally with the new law, it says you can only fill for a C2 pain med, you can only do for three days, maybe up to seven days if you write what? Acute pain exemption. If you want to fill it for a full 30-day amount for a chronic pain patient, you have to write non-acute pain on there. So that way they know it's chronic pain issue you're dealing with, and that will lift that seven-day restriction. You can fill it for the whole month, right? Now, again, if you write that prescription without the, the non-acute pain on there and you send it to the pharmacy, does that mean the pharmacy can't fill it? You may have people that will say, I'm, I'm just not going to fill it. It doesn't say it on there. I'm not going to put it away. But the law actually allows for pharmacists to call you up and say, hey, you didn't write this on there. Is this what you meant? 
You say, yeah, that's what I meant, and then you can actually put, put that on there. Okay. So just be aware that we can actually take that down as a verbal and, and annotate the prescription. Will pharmacists um, be concerned if patients keep coming back with acute pain prescriptions? So if they had enough, for example, where I worked, knee replacement surgery, you had to need pain medication for mm -hmm. writing it for three days and constantly bringing it back. It's a hassle. So would they question it? You just keep writing acute pain on there. Yeah. So if I had the same patient coming back in time and time again for seven days or seven days or seven, I would definitely ask the question of like, hey, what's going on here with this, right? Uh, but again, if somebody's going to need that chronic therapy, just write non-acute pain on it, and then you're covered from that standpoint, right? Um, so again, there's little ways to, to deal with that. And again, you know, um, depending on the pharmacist you're doing, some of them are huge sticklers, and they say, I'm just not going to do it. It doesn't say it on there. And they're done with it. Some people, there are some pharmacists just don't feel C2s altogether. They've been burned too many times, and I'm just not going to do it. Again, I'm a really bad pharmacist. I usually don't even like a whole lot of pharmacists. My wife's like one exception, I think, for the most part. But um, yeah, so, so there you'll find some some sticklers out there. But they absolutely can, per law, call you up and say, hey, you know, can I write this down on the prescription? You say yes, and then they can they can annotate that. So just be aware that's uh, that's definitely written into the law. They want to stop patients from getting their pain meds if they really need them. Okay. Um, Anyway, so again, good for short-term therapy, then really not designed for long-term use. However, a lot of patients will end up on long-term opioids, unfortunately. Um, next, we have glucosamine and chondroitin. What do we use this for? Well, basically, we're trying to use this to try to help restore some of that synovial lining if possible. Now, are these prescription products? No, these are herbal, are dietary supplements, essentially, right? Which means, does the FDA have a whole lot of oversight on them? Not really, not a whole lot, right? The FDA is only going to come in for a dietary supplement if there's concerns for safety, right? So again, if you think about, remember those um, OxyCut from back in the day? I don't know if they still make it or not, but there were some versions of it that had a, a, a hepatotoxin in it. FDA is able to come in and say, hey, we're testing this stuff. It has causes hepatotoxicity. We're, we're going to remove this product from the market, right? But again, they don't have to show necessary efficacy here. Glucosamine chondroitin. Very nice safety profile, really not a whole lot of issues with it, um, and does have some evidence for efficacy. Now, is it going to keep someone from needing to have knee surgery one day? Probably not, but it can maybe help slow down the progression a little bit, maybe help with that, especially like you think like an athlete, you know, they're going to cause repetitive injury to that joint over time. Like maybe, maybe this is good to maybe slow down things a little bit, but ultimately they need a knee replacement or a hip replacement. This is, this is not going to be the thing that's going to stop that, right? But useful for some patients. Um, in fact, there's, you know, some, some large studies that actually show some, some modest benefit with this. As I mentioned, relatively safe. Of course, you want to make sure you're buying a nice reputable brand. You don't want to necessarily like get your glucosamine chondroitin from some guy off the street, obviously. And if you want to get like actual name brand or something like that, it could be um, you know, be more relatively assured that what it says on the bottle is actually what's in there is what you're looking for. Um, but just know as well that the two together, uh, you do want to be careful if they have a shellfish allergy. I believe it's a chondroitin that actually comes from um, one of them comes from shark cartilage, and the other one actually comes from like a shellfish base. Um, so you want to be careful with that if they have an allergy. They usually uh, just come together, uh, so you can't really necessarily get one by itself. But um, if they do have the allergy, they may need to avoid it because they may have a cross uh, sensitivity there. Okay. Uh, other things we can do, we can actually have hyaluronate injections. So this is actually would be an intra in, uh, articular injection, especially for things like knee osteoarthritis. Um, basically, it's kind of replacing this constituent of the, the, the synovial fluid. It has some anti-inflammatory properties, so it's good for helping to decrease pain. Um, it can definitely increase the joint mobility as well. So again, from a functional standpoint, that could be very beneficial to them. Um, and typically given once every three to five weeks or so. Um, nice thing here, no systemic toxicity to note. Um, really, the biggest risk you think about with intra-articular injections is what? Yeah, infection is the biggest thing, right? Because again, that's really kind of a protected space. So if that gets infected, it can get pretty nasty pretty quick. So you want to you make sure they're using good sterile protocol when they're doing that uh, to make sure it does not get infected there. So looking at knee and hip osteoarthritis, how you would manage that specifically. So kind of a few different caveats here. So um, again, looking at do they actually require pharmacologic therapy? Are they doing all the stuff from the non-farm side they should be doing, like PT? Are they losing weight? Are they doing all those different things? And then looking at it, is acetaminophen contraindicated? So again, who would it be contraindicated in? They got a bum liver, right? So again, they have significant hepatotoxicity or they have you know severe liver dysfunction, probably not gonna be a good candidate for acetaminophen. So uh, if they are gonna be contraindicated from that, this is where we're gonna rely more on things like topical NSAIDs, um, you know, oral NSAIDs could be potentially being used here. Um, but again, be careful with the older patients, right? They're over 75, oral NSAIDs may not be the best option for them. 
but look at things like intraarticular corticosteroids, how you're on injections, things like that. If you can use acetaminophen, they're not a chronic drinker and they have a good liver, um, you get a four gram max a day is what they're going to be taking there. So um, usually, and there's no real good long acting form, so you're just going to be like a gram every six hours or so. Um, and then looking at it, is it effective? If yes, okay, keep on doing what you're doing. If not, then this is where you have to consider things like getting surgery, things like opioid analgesics come into play at this point. And there's actually some evidence for using duloxetine for knee osteoarthritis specifically. Duloxetine is what kind of drug? SNRI, right? So, so maybe there's some help, maybe there's some helping with some of the, the nerve pain there associated with that may have some benefit, right? Doesn't It's not really neuropathic pain like you normally think about, but there has been some evidence to show that it does work there, right? So something to consider. Right hand osteoarthritis, you're going to again find um, that you know topical products can be very good if you are dealing with patients who are older and may not be good candidates for oral NSAIDs. Um, so you know topical capsaicin, you know topical NSAIDs. Tramadol could also be potentially used here. So tramadol is what kind of drug? Partial opioid agonist, right? So that can be somewhat used uh, there occasionally if you did not want to give them like a full blown opioid. Uh, does that mean tramadol is a uh, you know? Uh, does not have any sort of addiction risk. No, it absolutely does have some abuse potential with it, which is why it got bumped up from a non-controlled substance to a C4. So just be aware that it is still concerned there. Um, and again, try to use combination therapy if possible. See how they're going to respond to that, right? Again, can you replace all the hand joints? Not that I'm aware of, but certainly uh, knee or hip, that's much more going to be a surgical sort of intervention here. Um, but again, topical products can be very good because again, you're applying directly to the site where it's working. It can be uh, pretty beneficial there. Okay. So any questions about RA, OA, any that? All right, so getting into osteoporosis and osteomalacia, what's the problem with this? So I guess you're concerned with these patients. Fractures, fractures are a big deal, right? So again, if they fracture something, say for instance, they have a fall and they have osteopenia, osteoporosis, and they break a hip, it's no good, right? Because then what happens? be debilitating, right? It can lead to death. It can lead to all kinds of bad problems. So you got to be really careful with your patients. And again, older patients, they typically tend to be put on a lot of medications that tend to cause what? CNS depression, dizziness, ataxia, orthostatic hypotension, which can predispose them to falls, right? Again, so be very careful with older patients because again, being on medications like that, plus having osteoporosis, tend to kind of compound the problems of one another. Because again, once they get those fractures, it can be very, very deleterious overall. Um, also, we're thinking about things like vertebral fractures as well, right? You always notice like older people, the older they get, the shorter they get. Those little minor vertebral fractures over time. But um, anyway, so what kind of balances the the homeostasis of the bone? Like what kind of balances the the reuptake and the deposition of bone? Parathyroid hormone is going to be a hormone that helps with that. But more specifically, what do they affect? Osteoblasts and osteoclasts, right? Osteoblasts do what? Lay down new bone. Osteoclasts do what? They bring up the bone, right? We're going to talk about parathyroid hormone most, more specifically when we get into um, talking about the renal disease as well, because renal um, issues play a big role with hyperparathyroidism in a lot of older patients. Um, what do you think that is? Because we've talked about parathyroid hormone before. Like, what is, what is the parathyroids? What do they respond to? Serum calcium and vitamin D, right? Vitamin D and calcium. So if you're low of either, what does that cause? You're inhibiting that negative feedback loop, so parathyroid hormone gets released in greater amounts. Because the senses there's not enough calcium or vitamin D here, so we obviously need to get some more calcium in the blood. And the best place to get calcium in the blood is from the bones, right? Um, now, from a vitamin D standpoint, where do we normally get vitamin D? from the sun, maybe not today, it's a little overcast. Or diet is another big one. Is that the active form? Now remember we said that's not the active form. Where does it get activated? In the liver and then in the kidneys. So that's why you see with renal patients, oftentimes they have issues of calcium and phosphate homeostasis. Phosphate's another big component of the bones there as well. You see dysregulation of that. They also cannot activate vitamin D. So that's why you find that a lot of patients with renal dysfunction chronically tend to have hyperparathyroidism, which can predispose them to getting a lot of that bone resorbed or the calcium resort from the bone, which can lead to osteoporosis. So some of the therapies we're going to look at are going to be targeting the parathyroid. Other things we're going to be looking at trying to um, target the, the osteoblast and trying to uh, activate them. And other things we're looking to inhibit the osteoclast. So that's kind of the thing we're going to be looking at here.
Um, there's several drugs that have uh, the ability to cause osteoporosis or worsen um, osteoporosis. Uh, a few of them that I will make mention up here just because you're going to see them a little bit more commonly. Um, think about things like aromatase inhibitors. What does aromatase normally do? Produces estrogen. Estrogen has what kind of effect on the bone? It promotes bone deposition, right? Because what kind of people do you think of as getting osteoporosis? Postmenopausal women. Okay, so they have less estrogen, so they're going to get less bone density. That makes sense. Okay, so if I give them a drug that decreases the uh, the production of estrogen, that's where you're going to also find osteoporosis can be a big risk there. So bone mineral density goes down. You're going to see increased fracture risk due to that uh, reduced amount of estrogen there. We'll talk a little bit more about that in the OB-GYN section that's coming up right after this. Um, but glucocorticoids can do the same thing. We know those have a risk of osteoporosis as well. Um, how about a proton pump inhibitor? What do you think that could lead to osteoporosis? So proton pump inhibitor does what? Inhibits proton pumps. Where at? In the stomach, right? So what does that do to calcium? Well, the pH of the stomach is going to do what? It's going to increase because I'm making it less acidic because I'm not producing as much stomach acid anymore because the proton pumps are inhibited. Okay, so the pH is going to go up and that actually decreases the solubility of calcium. Calcium solubility goes down, and I can't absorb it because calcium has to be in solution for it to be absorbed in the GI tract. So again, these would be more for more chronic use of proton pump inhibitors, chronic GERD or other things. Um, and you can see decreased calcium absorption, and that's what we're going to run into. Hypocalcemia, which can lead to parathyroids, increasing release of parathyroid hormone, and that's you see that same problem happen here. Okay, so again, little things you have to think about these medications, even though that proton pump inhibitors like, has no effect on calcium. Well, it does, right? You have to think, kind of think through the process, so it takes three or four steps there, right? Well, things to think about. Uh, the other ones, I just highlighted a few here, um, you know, but these are things to think about, like furosemide. Like, you know you're going to lose calcium whenever you're given a loop diuretic. Okay, that makes sense, you know? Um, but, you know, just the, the ones that I kind of highlight here, these are more of the common ones that you think about. Um, I just know a lot of drugs can, can play a role here as well. So as I mentioned, um, there's that delicate balance between the osteoclast and the osteoblast. Obviously, you want to have or in these patients, you're having more clast activity than you're having blast activity. That's why you're getting the bone being resorbed there. Um, and obviously things like estrogen is gonna have a pro bone effects, like it's gonna be able to increase deposition of calcium. Testosterone typically has what kind of effects on the bone? Typically positive effects can cause deposition there. PTH though, that's the opposite. It's gonna be causing osteoclast activity to increase. You're gonna resorb calcium from the bone there, right? And so again, when you have these patients, being in a more kind of hyperparathyroid sort of state or decreased vitamin D and calcium um, that sort of state here, you're going to find that this is, we're going to have more brittle kind of weak bones so that when they're getting up in the middle of the night because they're on a loop diuretic and they're on a blood pressure med, it's going to cause orthostatic hypotension, they get dizzy, they fall, that bone's going to be more likely to break. Okay. So again, this is why we talk about things being, um, you know, bad for elderly patients, especially in combination because they can see how these can compound uh, the problems with one another. Anyway, so as I mentioned, um, vitamin D, we can get it from the diet, from the sun, but we need it to activate in the kidneys. So that's why chronic kidney disease patients have issues with this. And so we can give the active form. Anyone remember what I said was the active form of vitamin D? Calcitriol. Some people say calcitriol, I say just calcitriol, it doesn't really matter. Um, but that's the active form. So if I needed to give someone vitamin D, but I knew they had bad kidneys, calcitriol can be the, the option there. That could be um, the thing I can give to kind of circumvent that. It's more expensive, but it's going to be more effective for them, right? Um, and also in the cal or in the parathyroids, since that calcitriol being there, it's going to say, okay, well, we got enough vitamin D here. Vitamin D is also going to help with calcium uh, absorption from the GI tract. It's going to inhibit calcium secretion from or excretion from the kidneys. And that's all going to help to suppress the parathyroid, right? So it's going to help to kind of bring things back into balance there. Now, obviously the estrogen deficiency it's going to um, increase osteoclast activity as well, which is why a lot of um, uh, postmenopausal women can sometimes end up on what we call hormone replacement therapy. We talked about that before, or have you talked about that in the ob guide section? Yeah, it's controversial, but it's one of those things where um, having extra, extra estrogen activity around can help to be um, prevent you know, fractures in the long run. Right? Or some other, what are the negative effects of having too much estrogen around? The cancer risk, you know, have you know, storm embolism risk, you know, there's some other things. Um, but yeah, so we'll talk about that in the next section a little bit later. But um, so our goals here, 
we like to try to prevent any further bone degradation from happening here, try to stabilize bone mass and strength, and then hopefully try to build it back up if we can. So we have some several different options there. Um, and then obviously preventing fractures is going to be the biggest thing, right? And so a lot of the drugs we have for this have been shown to decrease that progression, decrease that um, that propensity to have fractures. And so, you know, there's going to be good overall for mortality and morbidity for these patients here, okay? Once a fracture occurs, Hopefully, it can help to reduce things like pain, deformity. A lot of these patients end up on chronic pain meds after a fracture, uh, one of these painful fractures, and then hopefully, we help them keep them functional and not likely to fall, have another fall again, right? Anyway, so looking at non farm therapy, talking about calcium and vitamin D. Now, again, where are most of these patients getting their calcium from? With their diet, right? Um, but also, you know, things like Tums, you know, calcium carbonate is a very common source for them to get this in. Typically, a gram to 1,200 milligrams a day is typically mm -hmm. sufficient for most of these patients here. Um, however, think about, you know, a common side effect of calcium is what? Constipation, right? You know, especially if they're on other medications like calcium channel blockers, if they're on opioids, it's also going to cause constipation, maybe kind of intolerable to them, but something to think about. Not only that, there's a ton of drug interactions. They can bind up with other things in the GI tract, so you usually want to separate calcium out from other medications are going to be taking here, so that's important to know. Uh, and then vitamin D, as I mentioned. Again, if they have a bad liver or bad kidneys, you need to give the active form for them. So again, you can give calcitriol in order to get around that, okay? Um, normally, what you're going to find is that you can supplement calcium and vitamin D all day long. It may not be sufficient for all, all the patients out there, so you may need to actually give some medications in order to treat and or prevent it, right? So again, that's why we're going to be checking like DEXA scans and things like that to make sure that we're seeing how the progression is going so we can hopefully intervene before it's actually gone too far there. Um, so typically, we'll start prescription therapy for uh, postmenopausal women uh, or men greater than 50 years if they have already diagnosed osteoporosis or if they have these probabilities of having a fracture. So say, for instance, within the next 10 years, we think they have low bone mass and you have a 3% chance of a hip fracture or more, yeah, we're going to go ahead and initiate therapy for you, right? Things like that. I'm not going to ask you specific percentages, but just know that these are the type of patients that we think are high risk enough that we want to go ahead and initiate therapy for them. Okay. So we'll talk about our anti-resorptive therapy. We already mentioned calcium and vitamin D. We'll talk about bisphosphonates. We'll talk about the CIRMS. CIRMS just means, anyone know? Uh, so selective estrogen receptor modulators, that doesn't actually have to do anything with uh, reuptake, but uh, receptors are there. I was talking about calcitonin, uh, denosumab, estrogen, testosterone, we'll talk about all of those. I believe we'll probably have to talk about them next time because I think I'm out of time, if you guys are okay with that. I mean, I can go through lunch if you want. Okay, uh, let me check the board real quick.